Okay, this is Paul Lynch. Um, I am uh, doing another nightly update on uh, COVID-19. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm an anesthesiologist and pain management doctor from Arizona. And uh, I spent the last uh, three or four weeks um, either in New York City or in quarantine after being in New York, um, after uh, kind of fighting on the front lines um, with the coronavirus. Um, Tonight I want to talk um, about five things. Uh, one, and the most exciting, is today is going to be my last day in quarantine. Um, it's been 10 days now since uh, um, I had a fever and um, several weeks since my first symptoms. And so I've met all the CDC criteria for emerging from quarantine. So I am back in Arizona and I'm going to, at the end of this video, um, show me uh, meeting my kids. I haven't seen them yet. And so I'm so excited to go see them and I'm going to try to videotape and put it on here because I know a lot of you guys have uh, um, wanted me to see my family again. So today's the day. I'm super excited about that. Maybe an hour from now. Um, and uh, so I want, I want to talk a little bit about um, me coming out of quarantine. Um, I want to talk to you guys today about what's happening with the disease today. Um, and then I want to get into a little bit about what this disease is going to do. Um, I've tried to avoid that a little bit because I think, you know, I'm, a, I'm an anesthesiologist, not an epidemiologist. It sounds like a rap song. I'm an anesthesiologist, not an epidemiologist. Um, but I think so many people have asked me and I, uh, I've kind of thought about these videos as what I would say to my own friends or family. And I have no problem telling my own friends or family what I think is going to happen. So I'm just going to go ahead and tell you guys tonight. Um, although, you know, I'd appreciate if you don't hold me to it. Um, because it's not like I, I have a crystal ball for the future, but I at least want to have an honest conversation about where this is going. Um, and then um, I'm going to touch a little bit on the remdesivir trials um, that were released. There's actually two big trials that were released in the last 48 hours. I'm going to touch on that and how we should interpret it. Um, I want to address the, uh, the concept of all or nothing thinking today, which is a cognitive uh, distortion, which is common with all of us. But I want to talk about it a little bit and how it affects our behavior and, and maybe even the reopening. And then at the end, I'll show you guys a video, hopefully, of me um, uh, reuniting with my kids. It hasn't happened yet. That's in the future. So we'll see if it actually happens. Um, so um, let me jump into um, kind of a presentation that I made for you guys today on, on the current state. Okay, so let's start off with what's going on with the coronavirus today. So in the world, there's now almost 3.4 million confirmed cases. Um, and, uh, and we all know that number is probably higher because of lack of testing, but that's the confirmed cases. Um, and then um, probably a little bit closer to accurate is 238,587 deaths now worldwide. Um, a lot of the data that's coming out the last couple of days, and I may share this on tomorrow's update, is showing that the death rate is probably significantly higher than what's reported. Um, and the reason we know that is because we can see how many deaths in an area are common um, this time of year versus last time of year. And what we're finding is there's a significant gap between um, how many overall increases in deaths there are and how many COVID deaths there are. And so I'll dig into that a little bit more probably tomorrow over the weekend. Um, but we think that these death rates are actually higher than are being reported. Um, I know it's kind of common in some of the conspiracy um, uh, theorists out there that um, the death rates are much lower, but the data is not um, supporting that concept. Um, so let's dig in. Just so you guys know, I'm taking this from worldofmeters.info, and I've posted uh, links to this before. Um, but I like to get my data each day from kind of um, nonpartisan, unbiased sources. And this is a really good one. Um, so you can look at not just the world death rates, but each country, what's happening in total cases, total deaths. You can run your own uh, numbers from this. Um, and so uh, in the United States, um, we're looking at... Um, uh, 1.1 million cases and 65,133 deaths as of uh, today, uh, May 1st. Um, and all the data is not in yet for today. Um, but these numbers are uh, continue to climb every day. As a matter of fact, if you look at these 65,000 deaths, over 60,000 of these occurred in the month of April. So we consistently in the month of April lost about 2,000 people per day. And unfortunately, that's not really slowing down. Um, I want to jump over to a different website, um, which is Our, Our World in Data, um, which is uh, put out by Oxford University. And also, I think, a pretty unbiased uh, source of, uh, you know, just kind of data. Um, 
And if you look at um, the last 24 hours in the United States, we had almost 30,000 confirmed cases and 2,040 deaths. Um, now we're hearing this concept of we flatten the curve or we're slowing it down. And I just kind of wanted to address that today. Are we actually slowing it down? And so here's another uh, graph from our world in data. And it shows, um, it looks a little bit like a flattening of the curve, but um, if you actually look at a trend line, they don't have trend lines on here. So I, I was able to download the data here. If you look on the screen, it says data. You can click on that button and actually download all the data and kind of play with it yourself. And so I imported it into ex, uh, an Excel spreadsheet. And what I did was all I did was just add a trend line. And the trend line is kind of showing you what the trend of the disease is over time. And so the dotted blue, uh, blue line here is the trend line. And if you look at it, it doesn't actually show a flattening. It shows a, a trend that kind of uh, is on the upward um, trajectory to the right. Um, and so um, I just wanted to show you guys that, that we should be a little bit careful in our thinking on um, is this actually slowing down. Now, certainly uh, there's not exponential growth anymore. And I do think we've started to flatten the curve, but we're not going to believe um, that we've really got control of this thing until we start to see a bending of the curve, which means the numbers truly start to go down. Now, you might look at this graph and say, well, look, it's coming down. But the numbers on April 16th, where there's that uh, spike, there was a lot of updating. For example, in New York City that week, they updated and added several thousand extra deaths to their numbers. And so it showed a spike in data reporting, but not an actual spike in death. And so um, that little spike there in the middle of April was only four days. And if you take it out, then what we see is um, a little bit of a flattening, but certainly not um, a bending of the curve. And I think that'll be important as we track the data um, over time. So the first thing I went over is kind of what's happening with the disease. Now I'd like to venture into new territory for me at least, which is predicting what the disease is going to do. And as I said before, I'm an anesthesiologist, not an epidemiologist. Um, that's going to be my new rap song. Um, I, uh, I want to be very careful um, that we don't put too much weight in my opinions on this. But I do want to have this as a forum to have an honest conversation of, you know, we are scientists and we can look at the data. Um, and um, I think we should, uh, we should. And so I started researching a little bit today on who is trying to predict where this is really going. So the first thing I found is the White House. And I looked two weeks ago, they said we would have 60,000 deaths by August. Um, and then last week, they updated the number to 67,000 deaths by August. And then this week, they've updated the number to 74,000 deaths by August. But I don't find any other epidemiologists that are agreeing with these numbers. And so I just, um, once again, I, I try to be very apolitical um, in my mindset. I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm a doctor. Um, I, I care about people and saving lives. And so, but I do want to say that the numbers coming out of the White House don't make a lot of sense. Um, we have 65,000 deaths today. Um, and it, there's not a lot of people out there that would say that we're only going to have 74,000 deaths by August. So, so I tried to look around to see... Um, <clears throat> You know, who has the models right now that I would believe? And I found the CDC website. I'm going to put a link below. But the CDC has done a pretty smart um, job of they've, they have nine different epidemiologists around the country and world who've given their predictions. Now, the, what they've done, I think, in order to decrease controversy is instead of trying to estimate this out through August or uh, the end of the year, or 12 month period, which would be really scary and also a ton of variability. All they've done is look over the next 30 days. And so you can find this right on the CDC website. They have nine different epidemiologists that are predicting what's going to happen in the next 30 days. So I want to show you this data um, tonight. So these dots here represent um, the next four weeks, what's going to happen with death rate. And I just want to show you guys, these are a lot of different, really highly respected institutions. So one's from Columbia University, the Imperial College at London, the Los Alamos National Laboratory, MIT Northeastern, University of Geneva, um, Massachusetts at Amherst, and uh, even University of Texas at Austin. And so we have a lot of different um, sources here. Um, and then what we do is you can kind of combine them all into one model. And so long story short, this is just looking at 30 days and the estimated death rate over the next 30 days in the United States is on the low end anywhere from around 70,000 deaths um, to the high end about 125,000. And that's just by the end of May. If you look at the best, um, or I shouldn't say the best guess, but the average of these nine models, um, it looks like by the end of May, we're going to have around 90,000 deaths. 
And so um, I report that once again, not to scare anyone, but just so we have objective data to kind of drive our conversations when we're talking about what's going to happen. And so it looks like the best estimate is somewhere around 90,000 deaths by the end of this month, um, which if that's true, means that we will have significantly decreased the amount of deaths in May compared to April. And so I am hoping that's true and we'll continue to track, uh, track this. The better question is um, what's going to happen um, by the end of this year or within 12 months. And I've really tried to avoid this, um, this kind of discussion because um, it, you know, no one really knows. Are we going to have a, some kind of breakthrough medication or um, is uh, the summer heat going to you know, knock this virus down? We have no idea what states are going to do with social distancing. But I think just to start the conversation tonight, I would say that um, from all indications, this is going to be a 12 to 24 month battle. This isn't a one month battle. And so I think America needs to start to prepare themselves um, that this isn't going to go away overnight and that this is here to stay. Now, a game changing um, event could occur like uh, a vaccination, um, which could uh, truncate this disease quickly. Um, but right now, we don't really have any indication that a vaccine's coming for 12 to 18 months. Um, there's been several big trials, and I'm going to go over some of the remdesivir data tonight. But there's, there's no indication right now that we're going to have a wonder drug. And so I think we all need to kind of prepare ourselves for a long battle with this. And uh, my own friends and family have asked me, well, what, what do I think is going to happen? And I don't completely know, but I would say that we should all prepare ourselves uh, that this disease could still kill um, a half a million Americans before it's done. Um, and that's a really scary number. And no one's talking about that in the news because I think it, it's um, most people would find it counterproductive to try to predict how many people are going to die. But I think just having an honest scientific conversation about it is an important thing that we should allow ourselves to do to say, yes, this disease is real. This disease is here to stay. And it's going to kill um, a lot of Americans before it's done and a lot of people in the world. And so um, I just wanted to start that conversation today. I'm not going to harp on it too much. I'm praying those numbers aren't true. Um, but based on my experiences kind of on the front lines and watching this disease, um, I do think it has the potential um, to do that. And so we should prepare ourselves for it. And we should definitely make public policy and state policy um, based on an honest assessment of where this disease could be going. I may get into that more uh, in later videos, but I'm going to leave it there for tonight. I want to talk a little bit about um, two big studies that came out on remdesivir over the last 48 hours. Um, one was published in The Lancet yesterday. Um, the Lancet's a large, uh, one of the most well-respected uh, journals in the world. And this study was out of China. They looked at 200 um, and uh, how many was it? 237 patients. And of these 237 patients, um, uh, they did a two to one randomization protocol. So for every two patients who got remdesivir, one was a placebo, and then they tracked them over time. And in this fairly well um, controlled study, if you look at it, it's a randomized, double blind, placebo controlled, multi center trial. There was no difference in remdesivir. Um, and so that was a little bit um, discouraging. There was a trend in the data towards. Um, uh, towards decreased uh, um, treatment time in the remdesivir arm, but there was no mortality effect and there was no statistical significance found between groups. Now, at the same time that was coming out on the same day, the National Institute of Health released data. They didn't actually release the data, they released a summary of the data. So it's impossible to kind of dig into the numbers. But in this trial, which was a thousand people, they did show um, some statistical significance, which was, uh, I think, exciting to a lot of people. Um, there was a 31% um, increase uh, in the time of recovery in patients in the remdesivir arm versus placebo. Um, there was also a trend towards a mortality effect um, with 8% of the people dying in the remdesivir group versus 11.6 in the placebo. That wasn't actually statistically significant. Um, it was significant at the 0 0.06 level, but it was very close to statistical significance. And so um, there is some excitement um, that remdesivir could be, uh, um, could be used, but I would just... Um, I would just kind of say that we should be cautious with the data um, for a couple of reasons. One is if you look at the Chinese data where you could look at all the uh, outcomes, 12% of the patients in the remdesivir arm had to um, discontinue because of significant side effects. So 12% is a really high side effect rate. And, um, and then the other reason is just because the NIH data um, could be biased. I mean, there's, um, 
there's a lot of people right now that want a uh, want an answer. There's stock prices for Gilead that are kind of um, weighing in the balance. Um, there's um, an administration that really wants to have answers. And so um, I think when two studies are released on the same day, one shows no effect and one does, but the one that does, we don't have all the data. I just want us to be really, really careful before we start saying remdesivir is a wonder drug. Um, even if it does affect it, it's gonna be a small 30% reduction. It's not gonna be an all or nothing thing. And I'm gonna talk about that before we finish tonight. Um, but the second reason I would uh, um, kind of urge caution is I, we use remdesivir in our patients in New York. Um, a lot of our patients uh, were on this at the time they were dying and we just weren't seeing a massive change. Now that's anecdotal. And so what we really want is these big studies with thousands or more patients. Uh, but I don't think this is going to be um, a wonder drug that changes everything. And so we should kind of prepare ourselves um, for that. Okay, I hope you uh, hope you enjoyed uh, going through some of those numbers with me. Um, so um, one last thing I wanna address tonight is this concept of all or nothing thinking. Uh, I was a psychology major in undergraduate before I went to medical school and um, spent a lot of my time thinking about cognitive uh, um, distortions. And one of the most common cognitive distortions is called all or nothing thinking. And this way we tend to think of everything as zero or one binary, um, black or white. Um, and I think it's, uh, it doesn't reflect reality. As a matter of fact, life is kind of like uh, shades of gray. And so I've got multiple questions over the last couple of days um, that have come to me, and a lot of them kind of come down to this concept of all or nothing thinking. So one question was, do we actually um, test people for fevers? Um, because um, aren't we gonna miss a lot of uh, people who have the virus? And the answer is, yes, we should test for virus or for fevers um, every day. And also, yes, we're gonna miss a lot. Um, but some of these things that we do, we're not gonna catch everything. We're not gonna catch 100% of people. But if you check for fevers before someone enters your business, you may screen out 50 to 75% of those who have the disease. And that is a massive reduction in risk to your patients or to your employees and to your, um, to your patrons of your business. Another question that came to me is, should we really be wearing masks? And there's all sorts of articles that are circulating social media saying, you know, masks don't work. And I think there's some truth to that, but there's also some falseness to that. Um, masks don't completely reduce the virus. I wore an N95 mask every day and I wore lots of PPE and I still contracted COVID uh, because I was working in a uh, COVID only unit where everyone had it and I was doing aerosolizing procedures like innovations. And so I still captured it even though I was doing everything I could. Um, if you wear an N95 mask, it works pretty well, but not 100%. And it works better than a surgical mask which works better than um, wearing a scarf over your face. Um, but if two, if, uh, if two different people are in the same room, they're both wearing a mask and they're doing a relatively good job of keeping a seal and they wash their hands, then of course that's gonna reduce the reduction. So we shouldn't fall into this concept of all or nothing thinking where either masks are good or bad. Um, I think it depends on how you use it, but certainly wearing masks is gonna reduce your overall reduction. This all or nothing thinking occurs also with the remdesivir trial. Um, is remdesivir gonna be uh, a miracle drug? You know, probably not, but it might reduce the overall morbidity and mortality associated with this drug. And so, you know, we'll take it. And then finally, um, which I don't think I'm gonna get into too much today because this video is getting long, but I wanna to start to tease at it. I think there's all or nothing thinking on whether or not we should be locked down or reopen. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um, we're gonna have pockets of this disease popping up throughout the country over the next probably 12 to 24 months. And as a area goes through these pockets, we're gonna have to shut down. And other areas that aren't going through it um, can maybe reopen. But even the reopening doesn't have to be all or nothing. It needs to be nuanced. Uh, maybe we can reopen for some businesses and not others. Maybe we can reopen for some people and not others. And so I just wanna encourage all of us to broaden our thinking a little bit, to avoid the all or nothing fallacy, the cognitive, dis the cognitive distortion of all or nothing um, thinking, and think a little bit more um, in, in shades of gray on how we're gonna deal with this disease. It doesn't look like it's going anywhere. So that's everything I have for today. Um, I just wanna to continue to thank everyone um, that's been praying for me. Um, having you guys uh, follow along and giving your comments and your emails. Um, I read every single one of them. Um, I can't answer everything, uh, but that means so much to me. Um, the encouragement, the prayers for me, for my patients. Um, I, I really I do appreciate your support. Um, and uh, I'm gonna finish the video. 
Um, I'm literally gonna put down um, the video here and I'm gonna go outside and uh, see my kids and uh, I'll attach that um, for you guys that have cared about that. But um, it's been, um, honestly, I guess almost a month now since I've, uh, since I've hugged my kids. And so I'm pretty excited about that and uh, I'm really thankful I went to New York. I'm glad that, um, that I was able to help, um, but now I'm happy to get back to get back to my way of life. And I hope I can help some uh, people here in Arizona as well with what I've learned. So God bless you. Good night. I'm going to go see my kids. Hello. <laughs> Hi guys. Come give me a hug. Aww. Did you miss me? Hello? Hi guys, come give me a hug. Did you miss me? Yeah. Hi baby, you're off. <laughs> hi, hi. Even Alice here. Hi Austin. Austin, come give me a hug. Hi. Hi buddy, did you miss me? I miss you so much. So nice to see you. It's so good to see you. Did you guys miss me? Alex, where's my hug? What's up buddy? So nice to see you. Oh, I buddy. love you too. My little sweetheart. Did you miss me so much? How much? A hundred. I missed you a hundred. You guys are so cute. It's been so long. I didn't think I was going to ever see you again. I was just, how much do you miss your toys? Oh, yeah. Did you like your toy? Did you like your toy you got? Hey, Dad. You're so nice. Sometimes. So, are we going to have a big party?